Dear fellow learners, welcome to this journey to the ancient Greek underworld. Together, we will explore the theme of Oriental belief in relation to the afterlife. As you will see, ancient Greek representations of the underworld and the afterlife are very much indebted to the Mesopotamian and Anatolian representations we explored in other units. The main sources we are using are the first testimonies of Greek literature dating from the 8th century BCE. These texts are conventionally attributed to Homer and Aesop, who are known as the oldest Greek epic poets. But Greek epics are the result of a long oral tradition which goes back to the second millennium BCE and has obvious connections with Oriental epics. Therefore, it's not surprising at all to find that many features of archaic Greek literature, religion, and beliefs have Oriental parallels. Ancient epics are useful in understanding representations of life, death, and afterlife, but the clearest descriptions of the Greek underworld are the following. Firstly, Hesiod's Theogony, which explains the origin and development of the world from the first cosmogony to the reign of Zeus. Secondly, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which describes how Hadis, the king of the underworld, kidnapped Persephone, Demeter's virgin daughter, to marry her and make her queen of his realm. Thirdly, Homer's Odyssey, which describes the return of the hero Odysseus, also known as Ulysses, to his homeland of Ithaca after the Trojan War. During this 10-year journey, Odysseus went down to the underworld to take advice from the spirit of Tiresias. This episode is known as the Nequia, that is an evocation of the spirits of the dead. At the end of the poem, Odysseus killed the suitors who had taken advantage of his absence to spend their days at Odysseus's house, feasting on the livestock and trying in vain to seduce Penelope, Odysseus's wife. The god Hermes guided their spirits into the underworld. When it comes to the underworld, ancient Greek epics mainly allude to three different places. The first two, Tartarus and Erebus, are very similar. They are both as old as the world, according to Hesiod's Theogeny. They will be our first step into the Greek underworld. The last place, called Hades, is supposed to be more recent. We will go there in our next unit. According to Hesiod's Theogeny, Tartarus and Erebus were among the primordial deities born from the original chaos, together with earth, love, and night, just before the birth of sky, mountains, and sea. Most of these primordial deities were also physical places in the mythical geography of the ancients. However, from that point of view, it's very difficult to distinguish between Tartarus and Erebus, since both deities are connected with both darkness and shadow, and are located in the depth of the earth. The ancients usually divided the world into five parts, the earth, the sea, the sky, Mount Olympus, and Tartarus. Tartarus is supposed to be as far from the earth as the earth is from the sky, in such a manner that, for night, nights, and days also, would the bronze anvil be descending from the sky and come on the tenth on the earth. And nine days as well as nights again, would a bronze anvil be descending from the earth to reach Tartarus on the tenth. Tartarus is constantly described as a gloomy and murky place, a horrible chasm where even the gods do not dare to venture. It is the house of night and of our sons, sleep, and death. It is also the place of the Styx, the main river in the underworld, and the most feared of all deities. This place looks like a huge chasm that is enclosed by a wall and bronze gates. Swirling winds carry back and forth anyone who crosses its threshold so that it's possible to reach its bottom even in an old year. Tartarus is also a prison where any enemy or opponent of the gods can be locked up. For instance, Uranus, the father of the gods, 
hated the monstrous, gigantic son who were born from his wife Gaia. Some of them had only one eye in their middle four heads, the three Cyclops, others had an Eldrit hands, the three Hecatonchares. Therefore, Uranus locked them up in Tartarus. Uranus' son, called Cronus, emasculated his father and became the king of the gods. He was eventually deposed by his own son, the storm god Zeus, who released the Cyclops and the Hecatonchares from Tartarus, and instead imprisoned Cronus and his siblings there. But after this Titanomachy, Gaia and Tartarus gave birth to a last son, the terrible Typhius, who threatened the new king of the gods. However, Zeus succeeded in striking him with his thunderbolt and threw him into Tartarus. Later on, Zeus also punished in Tartarus a number of major criminals. Titius, another son of Gaia, was condemned to lie on the ground as his liver was being devoured by two vultures. King Tantalus suffered terrible hunger and thirst in the middle of a lake just next to a beautiful archer, but was unable to reach the water or the fruit. King Sisyphus was forced to endlessly roll up to the top of a hill a huge stone which always rolled down again and again, and so on. After Zeus had become king of the gods, the world was equitably shared by the three sons of Cronus, Poseidon, Hades, and Zeus himself. Heaven and earth were divided into three parts, and each of us was to have an equal share. When we cast lots, it fell to me, Poseidon, to have my dwelling in the sea forevermore. Hades took the darkness of the realms under the earth, while air and sky and clouds were the portion that fell to Zeus. But earth and great Olympus were are the common property of all. From then on, Hades became the mighty king of the underworld, the one who rules the world below. Just like Tartarus and Erebus, Hades is simultaneously a real god, Zeus and Poseidon's brother, and a physical place located far under the ground connecting to Tartarus and Erebus. This violent, terrible, inflexible god has absolute power over the countless spirits of the dead. Will you be brave enough to cross the Acheron and the Styx on the boat of Charon? to camp Cerberus and to enter Hades during our next sequence? Mm -hmm.